Kia ora uh, kato. I'm uh, Pia. I am very, very pleased and lucky and feeling very lucky to be here. So thank you for having me. First of all, um, I do work for the Canadian government. I am not representing them, <laughs> as you probably understand I need to say. But um, more importantly, that means I've been up since 3 a.m. So you are in the lucky position of getting to see 60% Pia, because uh, 100% is usually a little too much. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about is, I guess, my uh, some of my thoughts about what uh, trustworthy could look like for public services. Um, I'm not going to say that anywhere has achieved this yet. <laughs> um, and the reason why I focus on this, the reason I'm so passionate about reforming public services is because I genuinely believe they play and should and could play an important role in an equitable society. Um, not in every country. There are countries where the public services are used in uh, abhorrent ways and in every country they have been used in, abhor in ab abhorrent ways in the past. Um, but generally speaking, a public service is different from the government of the day. And when a public service acts in a um, independent way, when it actually serves the government of the day, the parliament and the people equally, you have something quite powerful. You have uh, something that can actually be a platform uh, on which the people can stand, um, a platform for um, equitable society, a, a platform for uh, social, economic and, and other forms of, um, of support for society. So this is why I'm so passionate about it. A lot of people are like, Gah, public service, why, why would you bother? Why do you do this? And um, that's why I thought I'd start with that. So um, why do I bother trying to make public services uh, more trustworthy? Because they have to be. <laughs> because um, people sort of are getting all very intensely interested in, um, in data and AI and automation and these kinds of things. Um, I'm actually here to say it's far worse than that. Um, we need to um, rethink public services in the 21st century because they are fit for purpose in the 18th century. They are not fit for purpose right now, um, not just in terms of their infrastructure, but in terms of their processes, their engagement, all kinds of things. And if we're going to actually reform them to be useful to us all, then we need to have a vision for what good could look like. Otherwise, we will inevitably, as we see all around the world, reinvent the public service um, in the same old footprint with shiny new things. That's why I'm here. Uh, so um, I thought I'd just share some lessons learned. I'm going to go through a lot very quickly. You'll have the links. Um, I don't normally do lots of words on slides, but I've made this as a bit of a discussion deck, if you like. So it does have lots of slides with lots of words, specifically to have a bit of a, a robust conversation, hopefully. Um, and the key thing is we did invent all of these systems. We invented all the public service and democracy and how we operate and all these things, which means we can invent it again. And the key thing there is if we don't, who will? So if you don't like it, change it is kind of the, the key point there. There is definitely a school of thought out there that, um, oh, well, government just gets in the way, so just get rid of it entirely. In my experience, the people that generally profit from no systems are um, the very privileged, <laughs> and so that's not necessarily a recipe for equitable society, if that's the thing that turns you on. Um, okay, COVID-19 has been a very interesting thing globally in governments. It has had this weird um, paradoxical impact because first of all, it demonstrated just where the gaps are. It became absolutely bleeding obvious uh, just how big the gaps were in society and the systems uh, because it exacerbated uh, inequity enormously in every country. And um, at the same time, it created a huge demand for change. So people are like, this isn't what I expect from my government. Um, this isn't expect what I expect from um, the services from the public sector, which is really great because people have sort of been whispering that and then speaking that and now it's being shouted um, because public services around the world have been put under pressure to just be efficient and effective but people expect more than just efficient and effective they want ethical <laughs> they want you know um, uh, they, they want good not just efficient and uh, so it's created this huge appetite for change but at the same time it dramatically accelerated the status quo because they just needed to get money out the door. They just needed to respond. They just needed to be able to close borders. They needed to do all kinds of stuff. I feel um, a little uh, sad because uh, I, uh, I did make it to Canada and was living in Canada and had a week there in lockdown before, um, a week before lockdown. Um, and, um, and they were sort of saying, oh, how are we gonna you know, make sure that people coming back to Canada are, are um, uh, compliant with you know, things like um, uh, self-isolation and such? 
And I said, oh, that's fine. Just put in place quarantine. They did not take my suggestion, <laughs> sadly. Um, and it's, it's uh, you know, to be in one of only two countries that really implemented that and um, are reaping the benefits of that is very humbling because every day I'm dealing with people who are dealing with the very real <laughs> ramifications of none of this being possible. Uh, so, um, yeah, yeah, a little humbling. So that paradox of accelerated iteration of the status quo, at the same time, we need to change. Uh, I've seen countries right across Southeast Asia saying it is neither feasible nor desirable to go back to pre-COVID status. It, it hasn't worked for a long time and we are going to choose to not repeat it. But a lot of Western countries are starting from the premise of when are we going to get back to normal, um, as if normal was uh, desirable. And so uh, it's been a very interesting thing globally to just uh, uh, contrast that. I'm very lucky in Canada, they're in the middle of a major genuine transformation program, genuine transformation of its public services, which I'm working on at the moment. So when COVID really got underway, they were like, oh, we're already transforming, can we just accelerate the transformation? And that's what's happening, which is quite exciting. Okay, trust is not optional, especially for public services. Um, I found this quote, Weirdly on Mensa Canada, I don't know why, um, but uh, trust of the currency of business, currencies, because this is actually, the, the context was about businesses, but companies which provide context, ensure transparency, and maintain auditability of their AI systems and algorithms will prosper. Uh, because um, that, that actually gains people's trust. This is m even more relevant for public services, which are meant to be accountable to the people, which are meant to be um, responsive to and uh, reflective of the values and needs of people. And I won't jump too much through a whole bunch of other random stuff. Use of AI is growing. The key thing is that we need to use humans for what humans are good at and machines for what machines are good at and people keep forgetting that. Um, I'm going to jump to a couple of key considerations about trust. Uh, first of all, complexity does require multidisciplinary approaches. Why is this something that even you should have to say? Well, because most public services went through this thing in the 80s and the 90s called new public management. And um, one of the outcomes of new public management was what I call functional segmentation. Policy people were put in their box, developers put in their box, design people put in their box, um, statisticians put in their box. Everyone was put in a box and not allowed to talk to each other. That's been the case now for 30 years. And um, that means that when policy do new policies, it used to be that a person who was actually a social worker wrote the Social Security Act. That's how it used to work. Now you've got someone who's never been on the front line, who's never done service delivery, who's never done social services, writing policy about social services. That's the professionalisation of policy led to a situation where policy is now done completely in isolation to input and, um, and also in isolation, and this is a secondary problem around uh, politicisation, um, um, and also not with um, citizens' engagement. The notion of having a citizen's jury involved in policy development, <laughs> you know, everyone's like, oh, that's such a crazy idea, is it even possible? You were doing it here in this country 20 and 30 years ago. In this country, you actually had citizen juries around major complex policy areas like gene therapy <laughs> in this country. And yet people uh, assume it's sort of a new thing. So multidisciplinary approach is important. Uh, and that functional segmentation has made that hard. Um, every discipline now, when you get them in a room together, you know, developers hate design people because, oh, well, they're just dealing with unicorns and fairies. The design people hate the developers because you're, you're getting in the way of a good idea, you just don't understand the users. Um, the policy people don't talk to any of us because you know they wouldn't want to sully their perfect policy implementation. Everyone has this weird snobbiness about their discipline. And when you get the disciplines together, and if you can get them together and say, we are stronger together, then you have a discipline friction, which everyone needs to be prepared for, and then you need to overcome that. Uh, so there's a lot of, I guess, social re-engineering <laughs> to get to a point of actually being able to build trustworthy infrastructure. Um, and participatory governance, of course, is critical. So what are the preconditions for trustworthy AI? What are the preconditions for trustworthy um, government? For me, that's about transparency, traceability, accountability, auditing, and appealability. Fundamentally, the two that are most important are appealability and auditability, because everything that those two require the rest. So. If a key principle for public services, and this is huge, is shifting away from this idea of how do we ask for trust? A lot of departments will say, we're going to go and figure out the social licence and then work within that, that construct. And the problem is that it, it assumes that it, it's not starting from a social contract perspective. It shouldn't just be a matter of how much licence do you give me to use your data however I want. 
Um, what, are, what, are the, what are the things you're comfortable for the public service to do and then we'll work within that. It should be both ways. It should be, you're comfortable for this, but I need to do this. Um, how do I, uh, so trying to shift away from asking for trust and to being more trustworthy actually means engaging people in what trustworthy means. Uh, I'll give you a small example. I won't say which government. There's a lot of, um, I have actually worked for a few other governments um, under the UNDP and, and World Bank in the past as well. So, um, so there's a slightly bigger pool when I say, uh, I remember doing a round table with a whole bunch of different departments about data infrastructure once. And it was very interesting because everyone's doing the usual debate driven by their particular agenda. And I just stopped the conversation and said, okay, I just want to talk for a second about your data and your personal information and your, you know, um, your context. What would it take you to trust the government to use your data? And everyone's like, oh. And they, they did, like, did a little, you know, we did a little post, I hate post notes, but we did a post note session. And they all sort of wrote down and, and then we had a conversation. They're like, oh, well, I'd want to know what the data is being used for. Well, well, I'd want to know what legal basis decisions are being made. I'd want to, I'd want to see the decisions relating to me somehow recorded so I could access that. I, I'd want to, I'd want to have um, visibility about uh, how they protect my data and, and have an understanding of it. All very good ideas. I said, okay, cool. The very next section was, um, question was, how do we, um, so what are we going to do, um, you know, to ensure, um, uh, I don't know, data security and stuff. And then they fell directly back into old habits. We're going to do this, 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 and this. And so I just pointed out to them, you realise that none of you have actually said the things you're going to do reflect the things that you as humans said that you wanted. And they had this oh shit moment, it was fabulous. Um, and um, one of the reasons why we've got such um, a disconnect is because public services got systemically dehumanised. And it's not that the individuals are not human, <laughs> but the way that the disciplines run and the way that the structures and systems run have systemically made it harder for people to connect with what's the right thing to do. <laughs> it's just, I just got to tick this box, I've just got to do this thing, I've just got to, uh, I've been given this task to do. And it's actually made it, um, so the reintroduction of, um, uh, well the introduction of service design and some of the design principles has actually systemically, kind of brilliantly, reintroduced empathy and sympathy and humanity into the public, into parts of the public service that hadn't systemically had that for a long time. Every, every public servant I meet with very few exceptions cares deeply about public good, Abs like they do. There's a, there's a small number of any organisation that are not <laughs> driven the right way. But, um, and the more senior you go, the, you know, there's an argument there. But, but most people have in the heart that they want to do the right thing for people and for society. So it's really interesting when you tap into that and you engage people in the, okay, how can we get a better outcome for society, for people? It, it brings them together. It really, really does. So some of these tools are helping with that. So... Um, I'm going to go through some concepts then. So, key questions. How would you audit the process in real time and proactively? This is not rocket science, you know. Uh, if a decision is made, how would the person be able to say, um, on what basis was this decision made? And can I, can I disagree with it? I heard an awful story from um, my, um, the place that, that, that my family is most connected to in New Zealand, which is probably not going to delight uh, the Welling Wellingtonians, because uh, we do love living here, but the place we most love in this country is um, Tūrangi. You know, and everyone from Wellington, from New Zealand will be like, why? But it's the place that most speaks to us. Um, and it's a community and an area that we just, just love. Um, and there was an awful story of a, a woman who, uh, so I've got a friend who works in the public service and lives up there and knows the community very well. And this, uh, and because she works in the government, people come up and say, you work in the government, can you help me with this thing? <laughs> Because um, they don't feel empowered. So this woman was saying how she applied for a liver transplant and got knocked back. And she was saying this to my friend like, oh, well, you know, I've had a good life. <laughs> and my friend said, well, but why did they knock you back? Oh, I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. Um, but I don't know if I can even ask. Of course you could ask. Um, it got, she did, on, on the encouragement from my friend and with the support from my friend, um, did appeal it. And it turns out they'd made a mistake. She's got a liver. She's still alive. <laughs> she wouldn't be <laughs> if it hadn't been for someone saying, you know that you can question that. But there's a lot of people that start from a place of um, pride and dignity that if they're told something, they're not going to sort of stand there and say, no, I want, I want. They, they don't even, they're, they're, 
And so government starts from this premise that, um, oh, well, if it's a problem, you can question it. It's like, no, you've got to make the re rationale and the reason up front and people need to be able to respond. Isn't it weird how if you get a mailing list, a bulk mailing list, you expect to be able to unsubscribe, right? There's certain things we expect and yet our level of expectation around government services is not quite that high. So how would you audit it? How would, you, how would a citizen appeal it or a person, not necessarily a citizen, how would a person appeal it or no? Uh, how would you know whether something is having a negative effect on people? It might be a high, you know, UX or CX or whatever um, user satisfaction score, and it might be a well-performing service, but is it actually having the intended impact? Is it actually having a wellness impact? Is it actually having a positive impact broadly? Uh, quite often this isn't measured, so these are things that we need to actually measure so that we don't unintentionally drop or create um, destructive systems. Um, so the key pillars from my perspective are traceability and accountability, human outcomes, assuming machines as users, and I'll get to why in a sec, and creating safe and ethically motivated structures so that teams actually have the time and space and dignity and um, ex not, not just permission but expectation that they do the right thing, not just tick a box, uh, which quite often they're under pressure to do. Uh, traceability uh, and accountability. Um, and I won't, I won't obviously go through all of this. Um, the key thing here is how do you know what the legal basis is, what the ethical basis is, what the basis is of a decision? Uh, quite often you end up with legislation and regulation combined with operational policy, combined with some weird black box system limitation. And that spaghetti mess is the basis of a service. So how do you know that the outcome was actually legal? Because over many years and indeed decades, that spaghetti mess gets so entangled that how <laughs> is this decision based on an operational policy, a system limitation or the actual law? We need to actually be able to get things like legislation and regulation as code, which I've been banging on about for about five years, um, are su such a critical thing because they are the foundation. They're effectively the operating model <laughs> of government um, and, and part of the operating model of society. So if we don't have them available in a codified form that people can validate, check against, um, and test new changes against, then how do you know if something's actually illegal or not? Uh, let alone, let alone um, um, auditable, shall we say. So part of this is about having that visibility. Part of this is about reimagining how government operates to be a 21st century version of administrative law, um, which a government is supposed to um, be accountable for all decisions and have visibility and auditability of all decisions and, um, and about then making that, um, that visibility and traceability available to all, um, all people um, that, are, that are living in that area, in that community. Um, the very dumb diagram that's new, you're seeing it for the first time, um, it is not right, um, I'm, I'm pretty sleep deprived, but I started thinking about this concept of government as a um, as a, as a structure where like the citizen experience or person experience or user experience, if you like, of government, people are interacting with, you know, democracy through elections and referendums. They're interacting with various services, some of which might be information or some of which might be um, support services or housing or whatever. Then there's infrastructure that people experience, um, road schools, whatever. Um, there's fiscal things people experience, whether it's paying or getting money for different things. And then there's, of course, law and order. And, um, and there's probably one or two others, but, um, but the idea that as a citizen, you're interacting with government in certain ways. Below that, you've kind of got all the ways that those things are served up. And there's lots and lots of different sort of those things. Here's an example. Um, but all of it is based on, fundamentally, only a couple of key things. Rules, legislation, regulation, case law <laughs> are the three big ones. The constitution, of which most of the constitutional, uh, you know, you have an uncoded constitution here, but most of the constitutional um, artifacts are either uh, statutory, which come under laws and rules, or non-statutory, like obviously tertiality, um, but al also weird things like the cabinet manual and letters patent. For nerds out there, um, they might find this interesting. Everyone else will be bored out of their brain, so I will move on. But then, of course, key things like records. There are things that government, that the public service specifically, are uniquely responsible for. Birth records, death records, marriage records, standards, the um, scientific, like you have one of the world's leading scientific measures uh, labs here in New Zealand, 
um, that actually determines how big a meter is. Yes, it changes. <laughs> you know, determines how long a second is, these kinds of things. These are really, really foundational things that then everything builds on top of, right? So if we were to think about what open might look like for some of the, and all of these are overseen by a variety of things to more or less degrees, you know, citizens, parliament, commissions, courts, audits, fourth estate. If we were to think about openness, and I've taken the citizen experience out just for the moment, um, decisions can't just be decisions. They're going to be records of decisions that are easily available, that are accountable, that are auditable. If there's a decision made about me, I should be able to see what that decision is. Can I do it now? Yeah. If you've got policies, you should have open policies. If you're doing measurements of what good is, those should be available openly. Got contracts, should be open. If you're doing public engagement, should be open. Uh, your project and program and, frankly, product management in the public service should be public, should be visible, should be accountable, uh, should be auditable. Uh, if you've got systems, assets and data, they should be reusable. If you've got regulation, they should be open. <laughs> um, Deshrouded markets is a new term that's starting to be about if you're going to regulate something, regulate it openly uh, because uh, that actually creates a, a greater pressure on the regulated entities to comply rather than just spot checking them. <laughs> um, you do funds management, um, then it should be transparent. You're going to have capabilities, make them shared. You know, you can start to sort of work through the how government operates and look at what open could look like. These are just some ideas. But also things like laws regulation should be open. How a department codifies its own legislation into business systems to deliver services to you, you should have access to what that looks like. So you can validate it's correct. Here in New Zealand, we found versions where the law was very clear, here's the calculation for this benefit. It was not that way in the business system. And it's because the 35 year old Excel spreadsheet that the business system was based on rounded a number down halfway through the calculation. Pfft, who knew? We knew. Um, well, we found it. But because there's not these validations against the law, it's very, very hard. Regulation is really good at this. Regulators build entire pipelines of here's the rules, here's how we validate it, here's how we spot check, and here's how we actually ensure compliance. But we don't have that same pattern repeated for legislation, which to me was an interesting insight. Non-statutory transparency and how these are applied in practice. You know, it's one thing to have um, a document um, that everyone refers to and reads, but how is it applied? Having that really clear, you know, helps then, you know, flush out whether it's being applied in a way that aligns with the values of the society. Records, you know, obviously, I think all of us here would be on board with open data, open standards, etc. But things that the, the, the public service are uniquely, specifically, authoritatively in charge of need to be available as digital public infrastructure. And that's, I think, a key thing that's been um, somewhat missing. Uh, policy development, I talk about this all the time, um, better rule, like um, the concept of actually opening up policy development and um, it does speed it up as well, but actually getting a more multidisciplinary and more open approach to it. Uh, you can have a look through that a little bit more later. I won't talk too much more about rules as code because otherwise you'll be here all night. Uh, so just briefly on the other things, um, if you want to get human outcomes, you need to measure human outcomes. Otherwise you end up measuring what you can and you end up, when you, when you measure efficiency, you get efficient services. When you measure um, cost, you, motiv you are naturally um, prioritising money over people. If you want to get humane outcomes, you need to measure human outcomes. So, I mean, it's, it's not rocket science and yet um, it's not necessarily prioritised. You have the wellness framework. We have the wellness framework here in New Zealand. So that's a really huge step forward. But seeing how it's applied is really the big next step. So the key thing there is you've got to actually, what you measure is what you value and until we start measuring human outcomes uh, across the board, uh, we're not actually valuing human outcomes enough. Um, <laughs> I talk a lot about how we all must do this work and the new um, Public Service Act. Has anyone read the new Public Service Act that came out last November? It's amazing, it's amazing. And, and now I'm nerding out entirely. Um, Public services around the world have been going on this, oh, we're just a business, so it's all about efficiency, bent for like 30 years. The new Public Service Act here in New Zealand is amazing because it talks about the purpose and role of the public service is to be in service to the public. It talks about openness. It talks about engaging citizens in the process. It talks about all the sort of things that we've all wanted forever, but um, it... Um, 
um, and it's in legislation. It's not like a guide or a policy, it's in legislation. So the trick now is how to help the public service realise the ambition of the Public Service Act. So I've just written an article about if you're not implementing the Public Service Act every day as a public servant in New Zealand, then you're part of the problem. That'll, that'll go down well, I'm sure. Um, it, it is a good article and, and I did have a lot of public servants help peer review it. And people do recognise it because a lot of people are very sceptical because when you read it, it's like, well, this is utopia, this isn't the current state. It's like, no, it's not the current state, but use it to create something closer to, you, to, to the utopia. Otherwise, you're, just, you're actually walking past and enabling the system how it is. And, um, and a lot of people are so hungry for change because of aforementioned change um, conditions. So there's a couple of you know, ways that you could measure um, human outcomes, and I'm really coming up against time. This has been just a little hack. Oh, they knew I was speaking, see? <laughs> yeah, no. Nah. By the way, this is still... Oh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll um, just go for another few minutes then. Um, this has been just a little hack um, in the true hacker ethos version of what we mean by hack, of course. Um, when people do service design, they're like, oh, what, what's the user needs? So I started saying, well, just assume a machine to be one of your users. Oh, why would you do that? Well. If you assume a bot is one of your users, you are naturally then going to design a service, a framework, a monitoring approach, all the rest of it, in order to enable good bots. Like, you know, your, the ability for, and then I mean, I remember when I was working here last time, um, uh, <laughs> Brenda and I were experimenting with this a lot, um, um, much to her husband's chagrin when she's in one room saying, uh, hey Alexa, I, um, I, uh, um, I've left my husband and lost my job. Uh, what services are available for me? And he's like, what? <laughs> uh, but we were experimenting with, if we made the eligibility and calculation criteria of public ser of um, social services in New Zealand public, then you know, helper bots could interrogate that data to just help me. I don't have to go to a government service to get that information. I can get it through my proxy services of choice. Not to say that government shouldn't provide services, it needs to provide services to provide the sedan of service delivery so other can people can do the unicorns and unicycles and Ferraris, but um, but it still starts to give some interesting opportunities, right? If you can start to open those things up. So um, at the same time, it also provides the mechanism to uh, design against bad bots. Uh, I worked in the financial intelligence sector for a year, which is <laughs> about enough. Um, but one of the really interesting things was um, the concept of Phoenix AIs. So a Phoenix company, you know, starts up a company, they shift money into it, they shut the company down, bankrupt it, and it's a beautiful way of laundering money. And you can do it in Ponzi schemes and whatever. A bot, of course, particularly a self-replicating bot, can do that millions of times a second um, and you wouldn't know. So suddenly, suddenly trying to actually keep up with what's possible out there is a whole different game. So trying to get um, regulators and service people and government generally to recognise that they're not just delivering things to humans anymore, they're delivering things to machines and if you want to get good human outcomes you need to create the incentive systems and system design that actually will benefit humans even if it's a machine you're interacting with, especially if it's a machine you're interacting with. And so um, designing for machines as users has been just a helpful little tip to uh, support that and it, it also helps with trustworthy services too. Uh, I won't jump into that. And the final point that I tend to make to people, it's not so much about infrastructure but it is key, is um, you can't get ethical outcomes from teams and from staff who spend 100% of their time just trying to cope um, and just trying to deal with the latest fire. So you need space and time and principles and culture and incentive systems and uh, you need to create the right social structures to ensure that um, public servants are motivated and supported and empowered to do the right thing, which quite often they want to do but um, have to do off the side of the desks, uh, if, if at all. Um, I won't, I do talk a little, a lot about, you know, understanding privilege and making sure that, because um, people are like, well, and I'll give you another example. Um, a lot of people in public service are like, well, we're trying to do a good thing, so we should be able to do whatever we want to do the good thing. I've literally had people say, um, well, we've come up with a way to stop uh, people who are vulnerable having to um, deal with the stress of um, having to pay this this thing uh, up front, you know, we want a chance to be able to mediate and support and, and, and whatever, so why don't we just get all the information about the Indigenous communities? And I'm like, whoa! <laughs> what? Uh, first of all, that's racist. Uh, second of all, <laughs> um, second of all, you are perpetuating myths. Um, third of all, 
even if you're trying to do a good thing, what happens when the next person wants to use it to um, target a community or to do something terrible or to arrest or to whatever? And they're like, oh, no, but we're trying to do a good thing. And it's like, no matter how smiley happy you feel or want to project, government is the cop as well as the social worker. So your systems need to assume and presume that it could be abused. So you need to set up the right systems of accountability, of oversight, of checks and balances and not just assume, well, it's fine because we're nice people. Um, set it up and assume that it could be manipulated by someone, the person to follow you. And, um, and that's a better way of making sure that you're not building something that can, uh, can be abused. Not to say you'll get it perfect, but at least you're not just assuming everything will be happy clappy. Okay. I'll jump past teams feeling safe just because we're right on here because the final thing I want to talk about was incentives. I've seen plenty of situations where you'll have goals and a, and, a, and a key purpose but then there'll be so much effort on the goals that they've lost the purpose. Um, so your goal might be, and I'll go back to the intelligence agency as an example, um, the regulators are all about how many compliance breaches do we find? So that's one of their KPIs. The, the intel folk are how many criminals do we find? That's their key thing. The overarching purpose of most financial intelligence uh, units is to um, strengthen the system against abuse. But of course those two KPIs are kind of systemically driving you to want to just keep arresting people so you're not necessarily motivated to strengthen the system against abuse. And so um, you've got to always make sure that your measures and your KPIs are actually driving the goals that you have, otherwise you end up sometimes perpetuating the problem. Okay, I'm going to leave on this note. Uh, I talk about, I actually um, have been uh, sometimes referred to as a bumper sticker generator. <laughs> this is one of my bumper stickers. <laughs> um, open that's not digital doesn't scale and digital that's not open doesn't last. What I mean by that is there's a lot of people who want open government and they tend to talk about um, OIA, they tend to talk about, um, hold on, it is OIA in New Zealand, isn't it? It's not FOI, it's not, it is OIA in New Zealand, isn't it? Okay, thanks. I've got too many governments in my head now. Um, they tend to talk about um, transparency of the parliament. They tend to talk about... Tran and those are all good things. But quite often, if it's just a matter of how do we get a human process to do something, then it's not necessarily going to scale. It's not necessarily going to give us the oversight we need. Just getting access to the budget papers in a non-digital format means we now have to digitise them before we can understand them, which means we're always behind the ball. So digitising open government is critical for it to be something that we can then keep up with, right? At the same time, plenty of digital government things are not open and then that doesn't necessarily lead to something that is um, correct or last or, or sustainable or trustworthy and those kinds of things. So it is my experience that actually doing both open and digital uh, in government, um, the two are, it's not, it's not a nice thing, it's not a because a, an ideological thing, it is, well it is a little bit, but it is, uh, it is if nothing else, utterly pragmatic. Like it has to be both because one without the other doesn't really work. All right, I'm going to stop there. Um, uh, yep, no, I'll stop there. The final, th no, no, I'll stop there. <laughs> I did say five minutes. Um, I, I might just do, thank you so much for having me. I, let's do a couple of quick questions, but hopefully that's been a little bit of food for thought for, the, for pizza. Um, and then I will get some more caffeine and I'll get back up to 60%. <laughs> I hope that was helpful. Go ahead. Gotcha. So the questions about MVPs and small scale experiments. Interestingly, I've seen this taken up in governments a lot. Um, one of the challenges, so first of all, I, I am seeing it a lot. One of my favourite examples of a department set up to try and solve a very real problem is a thing called their, their Futures Matter in New South Wales government. Their Futures Matter was set up as a new department because they recognised through data that they were getting a rising number of, of kids go into the, um, the ward system, into, into the state care. Um, they did a Royal Commission and it, it showed that it wasn't just rising, it was exponentially rising, so it was a real problem. Like, and they, a dramatic problem, they wanted to resolve it. So rather than just getting the same old people to just do the same old thing, they set up a new department and they paired um, data 
um, science with behavioural insights and then they did co-design of new um, interventions working with community, working with families, working with um, areas and then would implement those interventions in different areas and then what worked they would scale. So that's taking that um, um, experimental approach um, and, and really making it work for a policy area, for a really substantial policy area. Um, in terms of product delivery, I mean, I'm in the Canadian government, I don't know exactly where we're at in the New Zealand government, but in Service Canada, we have established, you know, an entire product-based approach, um, MVP-based approach. It is a struggle not because people don't want to do it, but because some of the um, habits of how things operate need to be kindly and calmly addressed and changed but they're committed to doing that. And so we're actually working through that and that's very exciting. And I'm seeing a lot of service New South Wales has excellent product management um, approaches and MVP based approaches and a good internal uh, expertise, which then helps them then engage externally as well. So getting away from that full internal or full external paradigm, which has never worked and trying to get more towards a, you need expertise in the public service to be able to engage expertly, um, which means you also need to do some stuff internally. So that, that, that picking up of and um, and adopting a more experimental based approach is important, but one of the one of the barriers that you I don't know if you've noticed this, but one of the barriers is actually again policy starts from a um, data driven approach. So they start from the perspective sometimes that the data will tell us what we need to do, and the data will tell us the data will tell us the problem, and the data will tell us what to do, and then they implement. <laughs> Um, so, so they're not really into experimentation-based, test-driven policies. So actually starting to say there is a role for both data-driven policy and test-driven policy is a, is a bit of a, a shift that's starting to happen in that discipline, which is, um, which is actually really exciting. Uh, the only reason I haven't talked about in this is it does actually have it in the, um, the slides about how to empower teams. But the focus of the talk was more getting to what are the, um, the pieces of infrastructure um, that need to be in place. And for me, again, rules, oversight um, and systems and, and some of those kinds of things is key. But how it's worked, I, I totally agree, is, is really important. So, yeah, good point.